The first thing to say is that it's incredibly natural and normal to tell the old porky, you know, especially if you want to sort of save face in a situation or avoid hurting people's feelings. My, my mother used to say, oh, never hurt anyone's feelings. So I'd see her tell the most dreadful <laughs> untruths in social situations. I would describe a lie as a deliberate misrepresentation of a fact. Deliberate. And I think that's the key thing. If I may make the comparison with a murder, it has to be deliberate to be murder, or so reckless of the consequences as to be the same thing, which would distinguish it from manslaughter, where you do it by mistake, it's not intended. Well, to me, a lie is something that's not correct, that has been delivered by someone who is intending maliciously to deceive. The intent behind it is key. It's intentionally saying something which is untrue. And I think linguists would say that um, lies and lying are what they call, or what we call, a language universal. And it means it's something which occurs in all languages. And one of the things that in psychotherapy and counselling, people have learned to realise that in an interaction between two people, that, you know, there exists different levels of the truth. There's my truth and there's your truth. And actually somewhere we might meet in the middle. So the truth is, is it's philosophically complex. The word lie is actually quite unusual in one particular way, um, and that is that there are almost no ways of saying lie in slang. In British English only, there's the rhyming slang, um, porky pie, telling porky pies, telling porkies. So a porky is a lie. Again, a light-hearted word. There's the, the word fib, which means a sort of little, perhaps harmless lie, which isn't really slang, it's, but it's an informal word. But there aren't any others, as far as I'm aware. And that is really strange, because slang has a thousand words for kill or rob or, or for, for anything sexually re, re, related. I have a sense that it's because even for slang, which de deals with some of the most awful taboos in human behavior, lies are so, a real lie is so absolute and so indefensible maybe, that slang doesn't go there. Now that's, that's a very strange thing to imagine. When someone is accused of lying, it sounds like a terrible insult. And, of course, it's even more insulting if you actually are lying. Why do we accept the lies? Why do we not see through them? But when we're talking about lying, um, euphemisms are very popular because people, people who do lie or people who trade in lies never want to admit that they're lying and, and try and avoid using the word altogether unless they're accusing someone else. So there are, there are words like, you know, half-truth, untruth, evasion. All of these words are really usually mean lie. The real euphemisms where a politician, for example, is caught out um, telling what most people would consider to be a lie. And one that springs to mind is to, to misspeak or uh, I misspoke. It's always easy, or at least people will try, to make their point using a euphemism on the basis that they will get away with that. An example would be, I think he's being a stranger to the truth. And of course, that is why then some politicians like Winston Churchill then coined euphemisms for lying then, given these sort of things. He coined the phrase the terminological inexactitude. But it's part of a long tradition, a long history, not a noble tradition, an ignoble tradition perhaps, but go back to Renaissance portraits and, you know, where the prince or the king is portrayed as slim and having an enormous codpiece when, for all we know, the reality was other. Later on, George IV, I was looking just the other day at a portrait in which he was portly, but in fact, he was apparently massively and terrifyingly obese in reality. But of course, you didn't paint that. When you start to normalize it over time, it becomes a way of life. And then you're living with long-term duplicity. We've got this going on a big time in our politics now, and we start to normalize it.
When politicians are accused of lying, they bristle and they, they, they bluster and they, they, they overreact. Partly this is because they hope by a strong reaction they can deflect the accusation, but partly it's because they know they've got to take it seriously. If you're in Westminster, of course, one of the worst things you can do is directly accuse a member of parliament in the House of Commons of lying. And so that's why if you, uh, the term for the parliamentarians is misleading the House. And so that's why the most they can say if they're trying to gently warn a colleague uh, about something they've said is say, oh, well, the Honourable Gentleman, I think you are accidentally Minister, misleading the House. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman uh, that I think in his intervention from a sedentary position, he may have inadvertently misled the House on this matter. No, no. I hope the word liar wasn't used, but order, order, but order. I'm perfectly capable of handling this matter with alacrity and I shall do so. The if term order. lie or lying carries with it a moral judgment. And I think that's what distinguishes it from other means of describing what is a lie. So that is unparliamentary and the speaker will stop somebody saying that or ask them to withdraw. If a member on the front bench used that word, I'm sorry, I'm not debating it, I'm not arguing, I'm not negotiating, that word must be withdrawn. In courtesy to yourself, I withdraw for courtesy to yourself. Usually people do. If they don't, the Speaker has the power to name the member and that will be followed immediately by um, a motion that X be suspended from service of the House. And if that is carried, and it usually, I think, will be because the Speaker carries authority, then that person has to leave the House immediately and can't return for five days, first offence. Politicians sometimes have to admit that they didn't tell the truth, but they, no politician, I think, has ever certainly willingly used the word lie or, or has ever admitted to lying. If people say something outside, as a politician, they are speaking in public at a meeting or on the radio, television or whatever it is. Um, so it's not quite the same thing um, as lying specifically in the House of Commons. So that I would, that's where I would draw a distinction. And of course, it can sometimes become a grey area because you can say something which you mean but which perhaps you're not able to fulfil. Now, this is where the, the promises, the manifestos and so on come into play or personal pledges. But you have to remember that a politician is often dealing with a number of people who have very different points of view, probably controversial, contradictory. And if you're trying to please somebody because you want to be elected, it is obviously a temptation to tell people what they want to hear, which may well then lead to your saying something which you don't believe yourself um, or don't agree with, and but you still say it. So that is a temptation. It's not so difficult to begin to recognise dissociation and projection, for example. You could see how that's happened on a, on a whole national level in, in, in over the Brexit issue where we projected all our fear of the future onto Romanian guest workers. When you look at something like Brexit, it does make sense and why the accusations of lying fly around. Because the stakes are so high and this is such an important process that clearly the debate and rhetoric is really ratcheted up. You do encounter things that do not stand up when you scrutinise them. And so obviously it's a responsibility of people like myself to hold these people to account, to assess their claims and to call out when they're not telling it straight. And this is where I think that the mainstream media, again, whichever side you're on, whether you're pro-Brexit, pro-Trump, pro-Boris Johnson, pro-Theresa May or pro-Jeremy Corbyn, the mainstream media has been complicit, in a sense, in all of these untruths and half-truths because they haven't exposed them. Well, obviously, if the media isn't there to hold politicians to account, who on earth would hold politicians to account? After all, it's the, our public duty 
to do this. Because if politicians feel they can get away scot-free with saying anything, then public debate itself suffers. So for example, we had an interesting case recently when after the referendum, uh, an absolutely very fervent Remain campaigner was trying to haul Boris Johnson through the courts off the back of the vote leave claim about we send 350 million per week to the EU. Why not spend it on the NHS instead? It's still rippling on today with again Boris Johnson uh, only recently defending the figure with the figure having become discredited almost from the moment it was displayed. The spurious attempts to try and drag the courts in show why actually it's responsible, it's safer to rely on the media because this is our job. It was incidentally manifestly false. The 350 million was simply not so because it didn't count the rebate that Margaret Thatcher had negotiated. For that reason only, it wasn't true. Because effectively judges were being asked to rule on political debate, whereas actually that should be the job for the media. The court really would be Sky News, BBC News, hauling up politicians, embarrassing them in that sense. Get more from the Open University. Check out the links on screen now.